Hi, welcome. It is really nice to see all of you here this afternoon. Um, for those of you who might not know me, my name is Miss Weideman, and I am the teacher of the Capstone class, and it's the Capstone students who are going to be giving TED Talks this week, today, tomorrow, and Thursday. Um, this is my second time teaching Capstone, and I really love teaching this class. It is a really fun class to teach because it's very different than any other class that I have taught. So if you haven't heard, maybe from Capstone students, um, what our class entails. I'll just fill you in a little bit so you have a context for what we're doing today. So we have a couple main units in this class this semester. It's just a semester class, so this is our last week together. We start in August by thinking about a topic that we might want to explore and learn more about. So students totally get to do their own topic, and it's really a sustained investigation in a particular direction because they choose their topic in August and then we work on that same topic all the way through the whole semester. So we talk about picking a topic, then once we picked a topic we do a lot of research, it's a lot of reading, students write a big annotated bibliography, they create an outline and write a long research paper, um, they have to come up with a project of some kind related to their research, so like based on what they've learned, what is a project, something that they can create, they work on those for about three and a half weeks, and then we've spent the last two weeks working on preparing these presentations for you this week. So the goal of these presentations is to inform our community about topics that we care about and things that we have come to learn a lot about. And this semester has been really enjoyable, but students have also had to face big challenges and there are tasks that are like genuinely difficult. And I'm really proud of the work that each of the nine students have put in. Um, and one thing this class really does is push people out of their comfort zones. Today, Tomorrow, Thursday is a really good example of that. It takes a lot of courage to get up on a stage and speak in front of people. Um, and so I'm very proud of the work that all of our students have done to get ready for today. So the nice thing about Capstone is since everyone has chosen their own topics, we have a really diverse list of things that we're gonna be going through this week. Today we have three really great talks from our first three ladies. Um, Nicole's gonna be talking to us about world hunger. Jasmine's gonna talk a bit about our oceans and then Natalie is going to close by telling us a little bit about caffeine which may or may not make you nervous depending on how much caffeine you personally have every day. Um, so we really hope that you enjoy. We hope that you join us again tomorrow and Thursday for the other talks and if you would join me in welcoming Nicole to the stage. Within the few years of having to fulfill required school service hours, I found myself at the front lines of human vulnerability. I found myself at places where people are fighting every day to struggle to live or even, and can't even obtain a meal. This bowl here, oops. This bowl here comes from a trip the Lions Club International took to their trip to Australia, whom I will talk about later. I cherish this as I serve it as a symbol. I cherish this as a symbol of the challenge and also the hope because a bowl of food a day can completely change Roy's life. Roy is depicted in the picture. But what I'd like to talk about today is the fact that 828 million people woke up, or one out of every seven, they woke up without knowing how to fill one cup one bowl of for a meal. First, I'll ask you, why should you care? Why should we care? For most people, if they think about hunger, they don't have to go far back into their own lives, to, into their own family history, maybe in their own lives or their parents' lives or their grandparents' lives to remember an experience about hunger. I rarely find an audience where they have to go very far back without experiencing this. Some are driven by compassion. Some think it's the most fundamental act in humanity, as Gandhi said. To a hungry man, a piece of bread is the face of God. 
Other worry about peace and security or stability in the world. We saw the food riots in 2008, what I like to call the silent tsunami of hunger, where it, slept, it swept the globe, where food prices doubled overnight. The destabilizing effects of hunger known throughout human history. One of the most fundamental acts of civilization is to ensure that people get enough food. Others think about Malthusian nightmares, a theory created by Thomas Malthus saying that population growth will always tend to outrun the food supply and the betterment of humankind is impossible without strict limits on reproduction. Will we be able to feed a growing population that will reach 9 billion in just a few decades? This is not a negotiable thing. People have to eat. There's going to be a lot of people. This is job and opportunities way up and down the value chain. But I actually came to this issue in a different way. This image is me in 2017 when I was having lunch with my mom when a similar image popped up on Twitter. And this is yet again another famine in Yemen in 2017. But it didn't struck me at that time. Because in this image was a mother trying to feed or nurse her baby, but she just didn't have enough resources or food to do so. And the baby's cry really penetrated me. And there's nothing more haunting than a baby's cry that cannot be returned with food. The most fundamental expectation of every human being. And it was at that moment that I thought, and I was just filled with challenge and outrage, that actually we know how to fix this problem. This isn't one of those rare diseases that we don't have the solutions for. We know how to fix hunger. 100 years ago, we, had the, we didn't have the technologies and the systems. And I was just struck that this is out of place. At our time in history, these images are out of place. Well, guess what? This was two months ago in Madagascar. Crops failed, and so they have to turn to cactus or leaves for food. This is yet again the face or the hands at large scale of 300,000 people wondering if they can make it to the next day. In fact, what we know now is that every 10 seconds, we lose a child to hunger. We know that the issue is not just production of food, not that there's not enough production of food. In fact, in 2010 and 2011, and during the 2008 food crisis, there was enough food on the planet to give everyone 2,700 kilocalories. So why is it that we have a billion people who can't find food? What are the solutions to end this global crisis? Hi, my name is Nicole Kaur, and today we're going to discuss this issue with a slightly different question, or multiple questions, as you'll see later. But what is one solution that cannot end world hunger? To lighten up the mood a little, let's play a quick game of guess who? Oops, sorry. <laughs> well, now you know. <laughs> um, number one, he is currently the world's richest person. He is a father of 10 and a Stanford dropout. If you didn't see before, <laughs> yes, it is Elon Musk. If you haven't been caught up with the news or for your own sake you do not have Twitter, you've been seeing this man show up all over the place, especially Twitter because he now owns it. But one popular interaction on Twitter was between the United Nations World Food Program and Elon Musk himself, and this is exactly what we are going to talk about today. On October 31st, the World Food Program chief, David Beasley, tweeted on Twitter that 2% of Elon Musk's wealth can put an end to world hunger. Elon Musk responded with, if WFP can describe on this Twitter thread exactly how $6 billion will solve world hunger, I will sell Tesla stock and right now and do it. $6 billion is 2% of Elon Musk's wealth. Let that sink in a little. Then David Weasley responded with a laid out plan. Number one, the World Food Program would spend $3.5 billion on food and deliver it to those most in need. Includes cost of shipping, storage, and transport by air, road, and river. And security escorts to safeguard food distribution in conflict-affected zones. Money could provide one meal per person per day per year, keeping, those from star keeping tens of millions of people from starvation. Number two. For the $2 billion could fund cash and voucher programmers in places with functioning markets, 
allowing people to choose the food they eat while supporting local economies. And number three, $700 million set aside for country-specific costs, such as setting up voucher schemes and building and securing local, to ensure, local offices to ensure food assistances reach the most vulnerable. Lastly, $400 million on management, administration, and accounting for global and regional operations. This proposed plan by the WFP is said to possibly feed starving children in Democratic Republic of Congo, Afghanistan, and Yemen, where food insecurity is rife. The WFP aims to eradicate world hunger by 2030, but they themselves have admitted that this goal is way out of reach. So can this proposed plan really work? Will Elon Musk really end world hunger? It was easy as it would have been to ask Musk himself, well, I can't say I didn't try, because I did multiple of times, but he did not respond. He was probably too busy trying to ban Kanye West from Twitter. <laughs> but since that didn't work out, I decided to seek out a non-governmental organization here in Penang and interview a couple of their staff to hear their thoughts and their, and their opinions on this global issue. Lions Club International is a nonprofit service organization where they volunteer and host events to help serve their five core concepts, diabetes, environment, childhood cancer, vision, and of course, hunger. I first asked Datin Chang, the head of the hunger committee, what really should be the first step into solving world hunger should be. To which she said, the most important thing is to educate the people. It starts from our country, our prime minister, the king and the queen. I left the conversation brainstorming the different ways I could use my resources, my platform with my voices to help educate the people around me. If you all didn't know, I am a professional Latin dancer and with my handy skill, I decided to team up with Lions Club International and my studio, the Dance Summer Spring Dance Academy to organize a dance charity event. The funds we raise would go straight to hunger hotspots in Yemen, Somalia, and Brazil, and many more. Not only can we spread the love of this art by the entertainment the fabulous dancers give us, but we also can spread awareness, take action, and work together to end hunger for all. I then moved on to interviewing Mr. Yai Keng and asked him, can Elon Musk end world hunger? To which he replied, it's a bit tough, actually. If we've, even if we put six billion out, how much of the six billion will really be channeled to the people? I think when people get this amount of money, people will get greedy. I think, so six billion from Elon Musk will not help world hunger as the rich will get richer and the poor will get poorer. The income disparity gap is too high in this case. If they want to stop world hunger, the poor people would have to be self-sufficient as well. The world produces enough food to feed everyone on the planet. At its core, hunger is a health equity problem. Solutions would not be found in the form of a $6 billion check. It would require structural change and a multilateral approach. Elon Musk knows this, and so does the World Food Program, who did not say that $6 billion would solve world hunger, but would help solve world hunger. The money will go a long way towards helping, but if Musk truly wants to help, he needs to stop centering himself in conversations about hunger just for clickbait. It is not about him. The issue is not that there is not enough food to go around, but the lack of self-sufficiency, as Mr. Yai Kang explained before. Food self-sufficiency refers to a country's ability to satisfy its food needs through domestic production. Historically, the UN's attempted food aid had been quite the opposite. After the UN received the Nobel Peace Prize in 2020, former UN representatives expressed their backlash. Merely transporting food into countries has overwhelmed domestic markets, ultimately suppressing local food production, bankrupting farmers, and decreasing self-sufficiency. The UN cannot supply food to these countries forever. The only way for the UN to combat world hunger at its root is to help countries become self-sufficient in the long term. Nevertheless, contrary to internet skepticism, their plan could be a start. The question circles back to Elon Musk and his role as a billionaire. Is this solution one that absolutely cannot end world hunger? Is it even Musk's responsibility to be addressing world hunger? Should the world hold billionaires socially and ethically accountable for amassing massive wealth? 
For the most part, yes. Wealth inequality is intertwined with poverty and hunger, with a small group of private holders holding the same financial power as several countries in the developing world. The Brookings Institution explains that if the world's put forth in less than a third of their wealth, they can help stabilize funding for world hunger in the long term. Let's circle back to my original question and answer it. Although Elon Musk, currently the world's richest person, may not be able to solve world hunger with just 2% of his wealth, he can, his actions can spur change among the elite on a broader scale and help alleviate the hunger crisis. It may be very short-sighted and small to think that just because we cannot immediately pay, world, pay off world hunger with one lump sum payment, it is not worth doing anything at all. Regardless of whether or not he will, Elon Musk can and he should. He is one of the most well-known billionaires today holding influence in every facet of technology and finance. Ultimately, his futuristic ambition equips him to be the best person to take this first step with the United Nations. Food is an issue that cannot be solved person by person, nation by nation. We have to stand together. What I would like to offer here is a challenge. I believe we're living in a time in history where it is just unacceptable that children wake up and don't know how to find a bowl of food. Not only that, transforming hunger is an opportunity, but I think we have to change our mindsets. I'm so honored to be here, and I would like you to join me with all of humanity to draw a line and say, no more. No more can we accept this. And we want to tell our children and our grandchildren that there was a time in history where a third of the children had brains and bodies that were stunted, but that exists no more. Thank you. Testing. Hello, hello. Does, is my microphone working? Okay. Um, first off, I just want to credit Ellie for <laughs> helping me brainstorm such a masterpiece of a title. But anyway, um, okay. Every child aspires to become something in life. Imagine this. 10-year-old me sitting at the table of the local seafood bistro downtown, inspired to learn about the ocean. Portrayed on the ceiling television, I was completely encapsulated by the vivid montages of coral reefs and deep-sea creatures. Growing up, I and my father would venture out to sea on his boat, and on vacation, we'd admire the incredible wildlife found in the reefs of Thailand. There, my love for the ocean grew, consuming my heart. I constantly wondered why I had never witnessed such reefs thriving in the coast of Malaysia. And years went by before I had first-hand experience of what the consequences of human activity could do to our oceans. Now, contrary to common expectation, living and attending school on an island didn't guarantee me pristine beaches and magical aquaculture. In truth, a simple walk on the beach becomes an entire cleanup Trash and decaying marine creatures infest our sand and water all along the coast. And our oceans are crowded with jellyfish and yet sparsely any fish. So I was curious to know why. Recently, I delved deeper into the concepts of plastic pollution and overfishing, two of the most devastating effects on our ocean today. Um, I realized why the, Chinese, the eccentric Chinese paddlefish went extinct in 2010 and why the smooth handfish can no longer be found in our oceans as of 2020. I'm sure most of you have heard it all. Littering is bad and large industries are profit hungry. They just want you for your money. But today I'm here to tell you why you should care that 29% of the seafood species humans largely consume have already crashed and that Perhaps in 50 years, there will be little to no seafood available for sustainable harvest. Why an estimated 17.6 billion pounds of plastic leak into the marine environment from land-based sources every year. It, roughly equivalent to dumping an entire garbage truck full of plastic into our ocean every single minute. Why that concerns not just the creatures of the sea, but humanity too. 
We've all heard the environmental speeches spoken by Greta Thunberg about the stories of scientists handcuffing themselves to Chase Bank um, due to our climate change issues and about um, the incident back in October where two British activists threw soup at Van Gogh's sunflower painting in the London National Gallery to promote the Just Stop Oil movement. Though controversial, all of these people had one agenda in common, to send a message out, to spark change amongst the public. Now, I'm not here to dump soup on valuable art or chain myself to this stage, but I hope to spark some form of purposeful action. One thing I struggled to understand throughout my research journey was why most of us often acknowledge how bad things are, but we never do anything about it. Sitting in the midst of a class debate on euthanasia, I caught a glimpse of what this reason could be. Mr. Kilgo once said, the best way to convince a person to change their mind on a subject is to make some sort of direct connection to your argument and their lives. And this was later confirmed by the solid research I conducted when writing my research paper on marine science and activism. Backed up by scholarly research, I learned that our society stays passive um, to environmental issues that ask us to make even the simplest of lifestyle changes because most of us haven't found that personal connection. Many of us haven't felt the consequences of our actions yet, so we have that mindset of out of sight, out of mind. And in short, we place a distance between ourselves and the problems our planet faces. Another possible reason, though a little unrelated to marine science, but just hear me out, is a concept I learned in a political communications course during my summer at Harvard University. It is the concept of selective exposure. See, humans are naturally wired to tune out information that we find dissonant or contradictory to what we already believe in because it makes us feel vulnerable. So thus, we discard information that makes us feel uncomfortable and gravitate towards the stuff that reassures us. Though this was in the context of political news media, I think the same connection can be drawn between selective perception and why it's so easy to forget about the severities our ocean faces. If we really let ourselves fully understand the consequences of our actions, we'll surely be faced with having to make huge guilty changes to our lives, something you'll hear more about in Kieran's talk this Thursday. Now, these are two highly possible hypotheses that may explain the relationship between public ignorance and environmental action. Perhaps they all work together to create a jumble of reasons why we currently think the way we do. But today, I'm here to remind you that we can't keep running away from these issues for much longer. So I want to bring you back to my story of reef hopping in Thailand. It was the first time I got to know fish swimming in something other than my frying pan. The truth is, marine wildlife is a lot more beautiful in the sea than it is on your dinner table. Swimming through stunning families of fish and algae opened my eyes to a world of oceanic wonder. I got to experience nature untouched by pollutants and relentless seafood industries. Not only have I had the opportunity to experience the ocean firsthand, but hundreds of scientists around the world have developed technology allowing them to explore our ocean floors via submarines, or even marine suits to allow them to walk underwater. These are the people that I like to call aquanauts, the astronauts of our ocean. With the help of these people, Google Earth partnered with the XL Catlin Sea View Survey to develop stunning under the sea footage from across the planet. We can now explore the depths of our ocean via Google Earth to get a glimpse of what the gentle giants our whales see. Not too far away, marine biologist David Gruber has just discovered that some ocean species are fluorescent when seen by other marine animals, but human eyes can't see this effect. Our oceans are home to so many diverse organisms. Corals, squids, whales, sharks, shrimp, fish, bacteria, plants, that are all vital to human life. And protecting them does not only secure an increase in biodiversity, but it secures our future. The poet Auden once said, thousands have lived without love, not one without water. No matter where we go, every drop of water we ingest and every breath we take, we are all connected to our oceans. 
The ocean drives our Earth's chemistry and stabilizes atmospheric temperature. It is the reason we have clouds in the sky, air to breathe, and rain to water our crops. It is the reason we have ecosystems and living land animals. I'd be a fool to say that the condition of our sea doesn't matter at all. Imagine our planet without it. Our Earth is 71% water, and our sea makes up 97% of that. Excuse me. We all fall under the premise that such a large percentage of water implies that our oceans are so vast and、um, resilient that it doesn't matter what we end up doing to it. Yet, over the last 50 years, people have drained the ocean of its wildlife and minerals. Creating an increase in ocean acidification that can now be tracked using new Autodesk software that allows scientists to to use the condition of coral to track the levels of ocean acidification, and as a result, reefs are continuing to die as I speak, and so is our main source of oxygen. I mean, did you know that more than half of our planet's oxygen comes from oceanic plankton found in the sea, which has plummeted in population by over 90% since 1940. And about 100 years ago, biomass, the renewable material coming from plants and animals, and biodiversity, defined in this context as the diversity of marine wildlife, thrived on our planet. And now, with newfound technology, we've discovered so many problems within the last 50 years, outnumbering all marine discoveries in preceding history. Since the late 1950s, our harvest rates, our harvest rates, have only increased. Reaching a peak of 50% of biomass in around 1998, depleting our oceans of fish, and I can assure you that wildlife in the sea is much more valuable alive than dead. Despite this, we still continue to barbarically kill and abandon sharks for fin soup and fish out endangered bluefin tuna in commercial fishing. And if that isn't bad enough, millions of bycatch. Fish that are not the target species、um, or extra seafood are emptied back into our oceans, dead. This gives no time for populations to recover, and our current protected areas need more help. And conveniently, in the worst way possible, carbon and coal emissions from large commercial fishing boats and factories pollute our water with mercury, a neurotoxin that can cause damage to our brains and neurosystem. Nervous system, my bad. Fishing nets are lost in the sea too, more common than you think, resulting in mammals getting caught in them, and higher surface animals such as our beloved dolphins and whales are in the most danger to being accidentally, mercilessly fished out. These are animals that are essential to maintaining the stability of our ocean's ecosystem, and more frankly, to our lives. So. In order to tackle this issue at large the best I could, I worked to establish the lot's first environmental, cultural, and humanitarian club, which I named Echo, alongside my co-partner Chika Tsumagari and club sponsor Miss Kentrell. It's set to open to the high school student body next semester. A vision reinforced by my capstone class, I've taken it upon myself to formulate an extracurricular where students can receive sufficient graduation hours via service projects we intend to plan next semester. And yet, channeled their creative freedom into projects that spread awareness and create change within our community. And in regards to my class project for Capstone, I've worked with both my partners and senior program manager、um, Alvin Chalia from Reef Check Malaysia to establish a quick campaign ad and informative film to give you a glimpse into the marine aspect of Echo. And you can now find the link on our Instagram page at Echo Dalat. During the process of filming, I was tasked to gather footage on pollution found on Tanjung Bunga Beach, which is the beach found right in front of our school. To my astonishment, I gathered more than five pounds of plastic waste within ten minutes of setup. It still amazes me how a custom society has grown to leaving trash behind, and it amazed me even more that about twenty steps away was a trash bin available to the public. In the interview with Alvin. As aforementioned, I asked him if sustainable seafood was even possible, if there was any action we could take now to change the dynamic of our sea. Not only did I learn that sustainable seafood would be much more expensive than commercial fishing for the same product, 
but that practically we can't halt fishing industries from continuing its work. More directly related to us is the fact that eating fish can cause higher cholesterol, especially shellfish like clams, scallops, or oysters, um, and lead to more acne-prone skin due to the higher iodine levels found in seafood. Additionally, polluting the sea has led to a real human cost. More than 90% of fish contain microplastics, meaning that 74% of fillets sold to you at the market might too. Ingesting microplastics are correlated with the risk of cancer, reduced fertility, and increased the chances of developing psychological illness, according to a report by News Medical. And according to Alvin, we have to work to call for an increase in marine protected areas in the media, controlling our diets consisting of giant predatory fish at the same time. Calling for government legislation and voting for people who care about our oceans are also a huge factor in being part of the bigger cause. And so there I was, walking down our very own beach, inspecting lifeless starfish, I took that picture, on the shore, and everlasting plastic in our water, a sight that has inspired me to reach out to Nelson Mandela's Leaders of Tomorrow, and yet to worry about Ray Anderson's Tomorrow's Child, questioning why we never did something to save our ocean and its wildlife while it still was here. I'll leave it up to you to figure out how much you want to save, protect, and restore our ocean, the blue heart of our planet. Is it some of you? All of you. I hope to have inspired a special and unique sum of this audience to dedicate time into change. And not only can we achieve this goal by changing some of our current lifestyle habits, which seem to weigh on our health, really, then build it up, but I encourage you all to campaign for marine protected areas, whether it be through media, film, expeditions, word of mouth, perhaps even my club next semester, in order to bring light to the ever-looming problems our world is about to face. Now is that time to overlook the distance we've placed between ourselves and our oceans, acknowledging the life essentials that it provides us. It is our job now to make this life a better one for the children of today and tomorrow and for the future leaders and generations to come. Thank you. Testing, is my mic on? Testing, one, okay. There's nothing like a morning cup of coffee. The aromatic smell of this brew wafting through the air as you get ready for your day is a much needed energy boost for our, our foggy brains every morning. However, imagine that you just stayed up late last night for a big assignment. By noon, another cup of coffee is required to keep you awake. And because of all the extracurricular activities offered at school, you don't get home until late. Late enough that you can't sit and take down and take a nap and wake up in a reasonable amount of time to finish your homework. So you take another pick-me-up drink to get yourself through your work session. This was my life junior year. Blissfully and naively unaware of concepts like overdosing on caffeine or increasing tolerance, I average five hours of sleep every night and two to three cups of coffee every day. And what did that get me? I had headaches on end and shaky hands on days that I drank more than three cups, and at, on some days, I could feel myself, like my heart pounding with so much force that it would jump out of my heart or something. And every day, I found myself needing to drink more and more just to achieve the same level of alertness I previously got from just half a cup of coffee. And when I finally realized that it was having a negative impact on my health, I didn't take time to do the research on how you can safely cut down on caffeine I just went from three cups of coffee a day to zero. And that made for a very painful process of trying to cut down on caffeine. And ultimately, I did succeed, but it was not pleasant. And I encourage all of you to reflect on the role caffeine plays in your life to this day. Now, if you remember back to three or four weeks ago, I sent out a survey asking about the caffeine consumption habits and awareness in our community. And I would like to share some of that data with you right now. Of the high school population, 
people guessed anywhere of a range of 0 to 500 milligrams as the recommended amount for adolescents to ca consume caffeine, with an average of 97.07 milligrams and a mode of 100. This is actually a relatively conservative estimate. That is, unless you weigh less than 40 kilograms, if not, that is your actual threshold. But according to the AAP, otherwise known as the American Academy of Pediatrics, they recommend that adolescents do not consume more than 2.5 milligrams per kg. Or if you work in the customary system, that is 1.13 milligrams per pound. And as that, that means that you can take your weight in kg, multiply it by 2.5, and then ta-da, you have your very own personalized safe consumption threshold. Of the staff population, they similarly guessed anywhere from a range of 0 to 500 milligrams with an average of 177.4 milligrams and a mode of 100 as well. This is very conservative for them because for adults, they can drink anywhere up to 400 milligrams of caffeine or 300 milligrams if you're pregnant or breastfeeding. Also in my survey, I examined variables such as race, age, sex, energy levels, stress levels, but all of these proved to be not statistically significant meaning that they did not predict and did not have a correlation with caffeine consumption. However, one variable did, and that was depression, measured by self-reported scores on a scale of 1 to 10 based on the severity and frequency in which the individual experienced symptoms of depression. And this is actually a very intriguing statistic, and I would like to explain why with some beautiful hand-drawn visuals. If you look over here, our body needs energy to function. And when it's creating that energy, as a byproduct, it releases something called adenosine, which attaches to neuron receptors in our brain to make us drowsy, represented by that blue square up there. Oftentimes, these neuron receptors are connected to receptors for dopamine, represented by that smiley face up there because it is responsible for making us feel pleasure. And when adenosine lodges into its spot, making us feel drowsy, it also, in turn, makes it harder for dopamine to find its spot which is inhibiting its mood lifting effect. And this is when caffeine comes into play. When we drink caffeine, because of its similar molecular structure to adenosine, it's able to take its spot without activating it, stopping it from making us feel drowsy, and at the same time, helping dopamine find its spot, which explains why we're simply happier after a cup of coffee. Another part of my project also dealt with tracking the sales in our store whether it be in the junior class store or in the staff fridge. And the three drinks that we bought the most of are Coke or Coke Zero, Mountain Dew, and Nescafe Original. And let's take some time to talk about these. Coke Zero is a very safe drink for everyone with 32 milli milligrams of caffeine, meaning that even children can drink it because they can consume up to 100 milligrams a day. Mountain Dew does have a slightly higher amount, but it is not a cause for concern either, I think parents are more worried about the sugar in there than the caffeine. However, what I really want to talk about is the Nescafe original. After digging for several weeks on the internet, trying to find how much caffeine this product had, I was unsuccessful, and I decided to take things into my own hand. Contacting their customer service, they got back to me a week later in the form of a phone call telling me that there was 70 to 150 milligrams in this product. Now, that came as a shock to me because what I originally perceived this product to be was some watered-down sugared coffee that people drink to stay awake. But finding out that it could have up to 150 milligrams is quite frankly very shocking. But because they gave me such a wide range, I decided to pester them even more to try to find out if I could get specific numbers. However, no matter what I asked, I kept getting the same answer. This is it verbatim there is approximately 70 to 150 milligrams of caffeine in the 325 milliliters can of the Nescafe in the original mocha and latte drinks sold in Malaysia. And coming out of this experience slightly baffled, I took some time to think about the implications of this statement. What are they hiding that requires them to give such a wide and vague range of caffeine in a product that they mass produce with a standard recipe? And why can none of this information be found online? And that leads me to a recommended regulation I think our school should implement. And that is, students should not be allowed to purchase coffee until they're at least in high school. And even then, 
school administration should seriously consider banning or restricting the sale of this product. Because on one end, it could have only 70 milligrams of caffeine, which is still a pretty reasonable amount. But it could have up to 150. And if you take me, for example, I can drink up to 166.25 milligrams a day. And even if I drink it, if I wanted to have a can of Coke or have a nice cup of tea later that day, I would be over what is considered a safe amount for me to drink daily. And for those of you who weigh less than 60 kilograms, just one can of this drink will put you over your safe threshold. Caffeine can also take the forms of other products, such as energy drinks. And these products take advantage of the lack of awareness of caffeine consumption to take advantage of their consumers. Take the VPX Bang energy drink, for example. I trust that those of you who are active on social media will remember a time when these, this company was promoting its product everywhere on social media, on TikTok, on Instagram, on YouTube. And you would, everywhere you went, you would see content like this and this. And so it's basically impossible to not know about them. And what is so dangerous about this drink is how they advertise their product. This is their advertising message. With 300 milligrams of caffeine, this drink gives you the energy you need to get through your next gym session, acts as an energy supplement to help you get through a detailed lecture on the importance of amoeba protoplasm, and can even double as an energy drink for a congratulatory night out after dealing with so many activities in one day. Let's take some time to break down the statement for a little bit. With 300 milligrams of caffeine, this is an amount that's scary for anyone even for adults. Because even though they can drink up to 400, 300 is a pretty big amount. And for an adolescent to be able to drink this product, they would need to weigh at least 120 kilograms or 265 pounds. And this is dangerous because they market themselves on social media platforms that are catered for young adults and adolescents. And when they are constantly seeing all these advertisements for this product, it makes it more likely for them to try out this drink that is dangerous for their health. The next part of the statement says that it gives you the energy you need to get through a gym session. In fact, this company actually recently lost a lawsuit over false advertising of their ingredients, including, including their caffeine and also the super creatine that was in there. And when it says that it will give you the energy you need to get through a boring lecture, if you really wanted to stay awake during a lecture, you can have a cup of coffee it is not necessary for you to drink a whole bomb of caffeine and have 300 milligrams coursing through your veins. And it is for that exact same reason that it is completely unsuitable on any occasion, even at a party. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not advocating that everyone throws out caffeine from their lives and never touches it again. In fact, I believe the opposite. Caffeine in reasonable doses every day can actually have health benefits including increasing metabolism leading to weight loss, improved brain functions such as helping with memory or reducing the risk of Alzheimer's, and just keeping us more alert, which is why we drink it in the first place. In fact, in my survey, 76.4% of people stated that taste was what incentivized them to drink ca caffeine. However, just like anything in life, everything must be taken in moderation. Caffeine at high doses can lead to very serious consequences. And these include headaches, nausea, dizziness, spasms. And if you consume up to 2,000 milligrams in one day, it can lead to hospitalization and irreversible cardiovascular damage. And for those athletes out there, even though caffeine has been shown to increase performance when consumed 30 to 60 minutes before exercise, it has also been shown to elevate anxiety and so when you want to use caffeine to boost your performance, think about whether it can actually affect your performance negatively by elevating your anxiety to high levels. For those of you who realize that you depend a little bit too heavily on caffeine to get through your day, whether it's that you drink too much or it just is necessary for you to stay awake, here are some ways I recommend for you to cut down on your caffeine intake. And the key tip is, to do it slowly. Don't do what I did, it will be painful and you will most likely not be successful. Always do it slowly so that you can get your body used to lower and lower levels of caffeine. 
For those of you who want to cut out the caffeine you get in soda, you can try sparkling water mixed with fruit juice for a fancy little makeshift soda. And for my coffee lovers out there, there is something called the shikuri root coffee that mimics both the taste and aroma of coffee without actually containing caffeine. But if that's too much of a hassle, just try decaf. But note that decaf doesn't mean a lack of caffeine, but rather a diminished amount. Caffeine has made its way into our lives, whether it be a staple in our morning routine or acting as a drink that we go out in social events. And its danger lies not in the substance itself, but rather how we use it. And so when you reach for your next cup of coffee, think about it. Are, is it giving you extra satisfaction and keeping you awake, or is it coming at the cost of your health? Thank you. All right, on behalf of the Capstone class, we are really grateful that you were here with us this afternoon. Um, I'd encourage you to come say hi or talk to any of our speakers if you're curious to learn more about the topics that they presented about. We will be having three more students present tomorrow afternoon at the same time, and then our last three students will be presenting on Thursday. So if you'd like to join us for those sessions, um, we anticipate to learn more about some more interesting topics. So thanks for being here today. Have a good rest of your afternoon.